killing comparison. You know, this topic, it means a lot to me because if you would have asked me three years ago if I was insecure, my answer would have been absolutely not. Absolutely not. Because I know what the Word says about me and I believe what the Word says about me. But the Lord took me on a journey that helped me to realize that what I knew in my head didn't match what I believed in my heart. We're going to be over in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 20. And if you don't know where that is, if you're new to the Bible, don't worry about it. We're going to have the text on the screen. But we're going to be in 1 Samuel, chapter 20. I'm going to start reading at verse 24. But before we get to the text, I need to give you some really important backstory. There are three people, three main characters in this scene that I'm about to share with you. Two of them you probably have already heard of and you probably know well. Anybody heard of a guy named David? Yeah. So David, he was the son of Jesse. He was the guy who killed the giant Goliath. And it was him killing the giant Goliath that got him enlisted into Israel's army. The second person that you need to know about is a guy named Saul. Anybody heard of Saul? king of Israel at the time. He was king when David killed Goliath. He was the one who enlisted David in the army. But there's a third person that we're going to take a really good look at today, and his name is Jonathan. Now, Jonathan was Saul's son. He was heir to the kingship because he was Saul's son, and he was also David's best friend. Now, the way that most of us know this story is we hear about Saul being jealous of David. Anybody heard about that? Because David, he gained favor in the eyes of the people. As a matter of fact, uh, the Bible tells us there was a time where they went out to battle, and when they came back, when Saul and David returned to town, Saul overheard the people say, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And the Bible says that when Saul overheard that, when he overheard the people seeming to affirm David more than him, it says, that at that moment, Saul began to I, David. And that word I, it it translates to him being jealous of David. He became jealous of David. And the way that we typically hear this story is that he became jealous of David because he thought that David was going to take the kingdom from him, right? That's what we hear. Okay, so fast forward a little bit into this story because Jonathan loved David. Jonathan loved David so much that he became his best friend. He became his defender and his protector. And there was a point at which Saul became so jealous of David that he told Jonathan and he told his servants to go kill David. And it was at that point that Jonathan said, wait, dad, wait, wait. Why would you want to kill David? I mean, he's, he's served you well. He's done nothing but benefit you. And so after listening to Jonathan, Saul said, you know what? I'm not going to harm David. But then a few verses later, <laughs> Saul tells his servants, actually, go kill David. So we're walking into this scene in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 24, where David tells Jonathan, your father is trying to kill me. And Jonathan is confused because the last conversation they had, his dad said he wasn't going to harm him. So Jonathan says, all right, David, here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. We're going to see if what you think is true. Instead of coming to this feast, I want you to to just hide in this field. And I'm going to tell my dad that you're not coming to the feast because you have to take care of something with your family. And depending on how my dad reacts, I will know if he means to harm you or not. Now we get to the text. You're caught up. Verse 24. The Bible says, so David hid in the field. And when the new moon feast came, the king sat down to eat. He sat in his customary place by the wall opposite Jonathan. And Abner sat next to Saul. But David's place was empty. Saul said nothing that day, for he thought something must have happened to David to make him ceremonially unclean. Surely he is unclean. But the next day, the second day of the month, David's place was empty again. 
Then Saul said to his son, Jonathan, why hasn't the son of Jesse come to the meal, either yesterday or today? Jonathan answered, David earnestly asked me for permission to go to Bethlehem. He said, let me go because our family is observing a sacrifice in the town and my brother has ordered me to be there. If I have found favor in your eyes, let me get away to see my brothers. That is why he has not come to the king's table. Pay attention to this. Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan and he said to him, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman. That's the Old Testament version of cursing him out. Don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of the mother who bore you? Pay attention to this. As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send someone to bring him to me, for he must die. Pay attention. We're often taught that Saul saw David as a threat to his kingdom. But he says to Jonathan, as long as the son of Jesse, as long as David lives on this earth, Neither you nor your kingdom will be established. You see, for so long, we've gotten this story wrong. Because we've been focused on Saul's insecurity. And because we have focused on Saul's insecurity, we've actually missed the bigger point. Because if you really understand what Saul is saying, David was not a threat to Saul. David was a threat to Jonathan. And yet, the one who David truly was a threat to defended him, loved him, supported him and encouraged him. Y'all, the hero of this story is not David. The hero of this story is Jonathan. Because if we want to kill comparison, we've got to ask ourselves, how is it that someone who had everything to lose was so secure in their identity that they were not threatened by the one who could have taken it. You see, I look around at our society and I see how toxic comparison has made so many of us fixate on each other. We see somebody else succeed and we feel like a failure. We see somebody else win and we feel like we have lost. But see, when it comes to insecurity, oftentimes we believe that the solution to insecurity is self-esteem. If we just tell each other positive affirmations with our children, we see our children and, and it seems like they're insecure, so we try to build up their self-esteem. But hear me, people of God, insecurity is not about self-esteem. Insecurity is about what your identity is secured to. And if your identity is secured to an insecure foundation, you will be insecure. Nona, what do you mean? Some of us have secured our identity to our job title. We take so much confidence in the fact that we're a manager. But wait a minute. That vice president over there is getting more oohs and ahs than we are. So we become a vice president. Oh, but wait a minute. The CEO was getting more oohs and ahs than the vice president. Some of us, we take a lot of affirmation from our relational status or from our financial status or from our academic credentials. Some of us are proud because we got a degree from the University of Florida. But hear me, I am a Gator graduate twice. 
A UF degree doesn't get as many oohs and ahs as a Harvard degree. And if you're not careful and you secure your identity to these insecure foundations, when you find out that somebody else has more or has better, you will start to feel insecure. And today God is coming for our insecurity. Because anytime we secure our identity to anything other than who he says we are, we are on unstable, fickle, and shifting ground. And this is why our generation, not just Generation Z, not just millennials, I'm talking about every generation. This is why insecurity is at epidemic levels because we are comparing ourselves to other people. And the word of God tells us, do not compare yourselves amongst yourselves because you are not wise. Why? Because you can't can't compare purpose with purpose. When God created you, I need you to hear this. He gave me such a powerful revelation. Jeremiah chapter 1, 5. So many of us have heard it. You know, before I formed you in the womb, you know, I called you and, and I set you apart. We've, we've heard this before, but we don't actually slow down to hear what God is saying. We think that life begins at conception when sperm meets egg. God said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. That means before the sperm met the egg, there was a calling on your life. That means before you were even formed in the womb, you were set apart. But what do we do? We come into this world and we see somebody over there getting applause. And so we decide that we want to be like them, not recognizing that what God has called us to is in the opposite direction from the applause. And so we're born an original, but we die a duplicate because of comparison. But God is coming for our comparison today. You see, Saul became insecure because he secured his identity to being king instead of securing his identity to the God who made him king. And it's subtle, but this is what makes us unstable. This is why you have people, I work in social media, this is why you have people constantly posting pictures about their family. The perfect pictures. But you know people were fighting and screaming at each other before you took that perfect picture. But then people see it and next thing you know they're like, well why can't my family be like that? But what you don't know is that smiling husband and wife aren't even speaking to each other. They just look cute on Instagram. So the toxin of comparison ends up making us compare our reality to other people's fiction. And God is saying, no, 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 no. You have to secure your identity to who I say that you are. This is why Jonathan wasn't threatened by David. Because Jonathan did not secure his identity to being the future king. Jonathan secured his identity to who God says he is. And I'm going to show you that in scripture in a moment, but I need to be transparent with you before I get there. You see, I'm not up here preaching theological medicine. I am preaching what I've lived. You know, when the pandemic first started spiraling up in 2020, y'all, 2020 was going to be lit for me. I mean, I had a full calendar of speaking engagements. I was supposed to speak in Africa, Singapore, South America, all around the United States, major conferences. I was releasing two books that year. 2020 was going to be lit for me. But then as the pandemic spun up, all of my speaking engagements got canceled, just like everybody. The conferences got canceled, everything got canceled. And I'll never forget, I was sitting at my desk one morning and I was getting ready to log on to a video conference. And, uh, and I went to uh, open my Instagram app just to respond to comments before I jumped into the meeting. And I opened the app and I caught a glimpse of my news feed. And it was a post I saw of a friend of mine who was speaking at a virtual women's conference. It was a large women's conference that usually met in person, but it went online. She was speaking at the virtual version of it. And when I saw it, I was like, oh, that's cool. Well, I scrolled down a little bit more and I saw another one of my friends speaking at this conference. And I was like, okay, you know, cool. 
I saw person after person after person after person after person speaking at this conference. And because I don't follow a whole lot of people, it was like that was all was in my newsfeed was posts from my friends saying they're speaking at this conference. Y'all, I knew all the speakers and I knew the host. So you know what I asked myself? Why wasn't I invited? Why wasn't I invited? Why was I overlooked? Why was I left out? Why am I not good enough? Why don't I measure up? And in the middle of asking all of these why questions, I heard the Holy Spirit ask me a different question and y'all, it stopped me in my tracks. The Holy Spirit said, Nona, why does it matter? And I was like, well, Lord, what do you mean, why does it matter? It matters because there's this huge conference happening, and, and I'm not going to be speaking at it, and they're speaking at it. And so God said, let me make sure I understand, Nona. So what you're saying is you only think you have as much value as the speaking invitations you receive. And I said, well, well no, Lord. I mean, <laughs> I know I'm fearfully, wonderfully made. I know that I'm a royal priesthood, peculiar people. I started to, you know, spout out all the scriptures about how great I am in the Lord. And God said, Nona, your problem is not what you know in your head. Your problem is what you believe in your heart. Because you have the scriptures memorized, but you don't believe them in your heart. And because you don't believe what I have said about you, you are insecure. Because you have secured your identity to people's approval. Y'all, God got me right on together. And that was the moment when I really started to do the work. I realized that for so many years of my life, you know, I was an executive at 23 years old. I had been named, you know, Essence 40 under 40, and, you know, Florida Trend Magazine named me a 30 under 30, and I got all these awards at the national level, and I was, you know, ambitious in my career, and all of these things. But when God sat me down and showed me me, what I realized was that my pursuit of all of those things was fueled by toxic comparison. I pursued all those things because I thought that once I get this, then I will matter. But once I got that, I realized there was somebody with more. And so it never ends. And this is why this message matters so much. Because comparison will have you out here pursuing things that you are not graced for. You wonder why you're frustrated, overwhelmed, and fatigued. You wonder why? It's because you're not graced for it. Y'all, I launched a podcast during the pandemic. That thing was exhausting. You know why I did it? Because I saw other people doing it. And I was like, well, I guess if I'm gonna be at their level, then I should have a podcast too. That didn't bring me no joy. I love sitting down and talking with people. I don't like planning stuff out and having to record stuff and edit stuff and all that. But I did it because I was comparing myself with other people. When I got free from this, oh, the podcast got shut down. Immediately. My chief of staff will tell you, and he makes fun of me all the time, but he will tell you, I will start stuff and stop it in a second. I will. Because if I realize I'm not graced for it, I will stop it. Because I'm not competing with anybody. So I don't need this thing to be successful. If I have an idea, I'll try it out. If I'm not graced for it, we're done. When you get free and your identity is secure, you will find that you have so much more capacity and so much more energy because you're not trying to keep up with anybody else except for who God has called you to be. You see, Saul, Saul forgot who made him king. Saul forgot who made him king. So when he heard the people singing about Saul killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands, he began to think, oh my gosh, well, if, if they approve of him, then maybe they'll dethrone me. If they approve of him, maybe they won't allow Jonathan to be king. But what Saul forgot is he wasn't elected king. 
Nobody voted for him. He wasn't appointed king. And the thing you have to know is that your gifts, your skills, the purpose on the inside of you is not something that somebody gave to you. And what that means is nobody else's opinion matters because the one who created you decided that that was his perfect will for you. And so when you surrender your purpose and you surrender your will to the inspection of other people, they're automatically going to disqualify you. And do you know how many people are living such a small life because the people in their life have said, oh, you're not, you're not qualified for that. You shouldn't be doing that. There's no reason why you should be doing that. Nobody wants you to do that. But if God has called you to it, he has qualified you for it. And so you have to stop allowing other people's opinions to dictate what you do and don't do. My family, we went on a cruise. We just returned from a cruise, y'all. And uh, it was such a fun time for me because it was all families, like just thousands of families just together and having fun. And I'll never forget, we went to this family dance party. And there was families with children of all ages and were out on the deck and they were playing music. And, and you know, you had a lot of people dancing with their kids and dancing together. But I looked around the perimeter and there were more people standing watching than were actually dancing and having a good time. And I turned around and I looked at my boys and I noticed that they were standing on the perimeter watching too. And I said to them, I said, I said, why are you just standing here? This is a dance party. We're supposed to have fun. You know what they said to me? Well, I don't want to embarrass myself. Wait, you will never see any of these people ever again. You don't know their name. They don't know your name. And you're worried about embarrassing yourself in front of strangers? But see, this is the toxic power of comparison. What toxic comparison does is it makes you shrink yourself down to fit into the small box of other people's opinions. Some of you are supposed to be preaching right now, but you won't step on this stage if somebody gives you a mic. Why? I don't want to embarrass myself. Some of you are supposed to be on the worship team leading worship, but you will not step on this stage. Why? Well, you know, I don't want all those people looking at me. But God has placed a gift on the inside of you. And you're worried about what other people are going to think. This is what the devil loves. He loves it when we shrink our purpose down to fit into the small minds of other people. Because if he can get us to shrink our purpose down, then guess what? The purpose for which God created us doesn't get fulfilled. Do you know the richest place on earth is the cemetery? Because there's so much purpose and potential in the grave. People who live their life small because, well, I don't want anybody to say anything. Child, I don't care what anybody says. I was out there on that deck dancing by myself. And do you know who blessed me? There was this woman up there. She had absolutely no rhythm. I think the, the beat was like, like this. Do, 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 do. And she was like, do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Like she was on her own rhythm. But when I tell you she blessed me because she was dancing and didn't care who was watching. And do you know who wasn't having a good time? All the people standing around. Which is why we have to kill comparison because it will cause you to live your life small. And the time I have remaining, I want to leave you with just three insights from Jonathan's life. Because like I said, Jonathan is the hero of this story. We give so much credit to David, and I thank God for David and how God used David. And I want you to understand, though, that Jonathan, Jonathan is the true OG. Because he was the one who David threatened, but he was also the one who was not bothered at all. And God has called us to live an unbothered life. The first thing I want to leave you with is this. No man is a threat to God's purpose for you. No man. And I need you to understand this because the lie of comparison will have you believe that if somebody else wins, you lose. But the thing you have to know is that whatever God has graced you to do, he has graced you to do. You don't lose if somebody else wins. 
Let me take you to the text because you need to understand who Jonathan was for real. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 19 through 22, the Bible says this was a time in Israel where no blacksmith could be found because the Philistines had said, otherwise the Hebrews will make swords or spears. So all the men of Israel had to go down to the Philistines, each to get their farming tools sharpened. The fee for sharpening was two-thirds of a shekel for the plowshares, for the picks, the pitchforks, and the axes. So it came about on the day of the battle, y'all. On the day of the battle with Israel and the Philistines, the Bible says that neither a sword nor a spear was found in the hands of any of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan. The only people who had weapons were Saul and Jonathan. Here's where the plot thickens. Israel had no weapons. Saul had a sword and a spear. Jonathan has a sword and a spear. Guess what Saul does with his weapons? He goes over to a pomegranate tree, sits down under the pomegranate tree with 600 soldiers and rests. Do you know what Jonathan did? If we read a little bit further, we get down to 1 Samuel chapter 14 and 6. We find that Jonathan took his young armor bearer by himself and headed over to the Philistine outpost. And what he said is nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. You see, Jonathan knew that it wasn't man's skill and it wasn't weapons that wins battles. It was the glory of God. Once God has decided he is for you, nobody can be against you. So you have to stop believing that a man or a woman or a boy or a girl is a threat to you because there is no human human being, there is not even a heavenly being that can thwart the purpose that God has on your life. Jonathan wasn't worried about an army. Jonathan wasn't worried about weapons because he knew that the Lord fights my battles. He knew that God had called him to fight the Philistines. And he said, I tell you what, dad, enjoy your nap. I tell you what, soldiers, enjoy your rest. I'm going to go over here and fight these Philistines because this is what God has called me to do. When you are secure in your identity, you don't need an entourage. I notice oftentimes we won't do anything unless other people do it with us. But let me tell you, uh, a few years ago, about 10 years ago, I was 100 pounds heavier than I am today. I had struggled for years to lose weight, for years to lose weight. And I would try to work out with people, and there was this one particular young lady who she said she wanted to lose weight too. And so we started the Couch to 5K program. It's this app that you're supposed to go from not being able to run to being able to run a 5K. So day one, we met at Kanapa Hall Park, and we did the little route that we're supposed to do. Day two, I met at the park. I waited. She never showed up. So I called her. I said, hey, I'm out here. Are you coming? She said, oh, you know, I'm not feeling well. I'm not going to make it. I said, okay. So I did the route. The next day, I show up. She wasn't there. I called her. Hey, you coming? No, girl, I'm, just, I'm tired. I'm not, I'm not going to be able to make it. Two more days, I showed up. I called. She didn't come. From that point on, I decided to go it alone. And 10 years later, I've lost 100 pounds and she is still trying to lose the weight. The reason I tell you this story is because sometimes you have to go it alone. You can't look to other people for approval. You can't look to other people for green lights. Some of us are waiting to, to act on what God has clearly told us to do because other people aren't going to do it with us. Listen to me. The grace is on the go. The grace is not on the wait. The grace is on the go. So if God has called you, go. No man is a threat to God's purpose for you. The second thing I need you to understand, something I learned out of this story that blessed me so much, is that despising your roots yields the fruit of insecurity. Some of us are insecure because we look at where we came from, our family, our complexion. We look at our physical appearance and we say, well, no, you know, God can't use me. I mean, look at where I came from. The thing about Saul 
Many people think that Saul became insecure when David stepped on the scene. That's not true. If you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 9, when we first meet Saul, when, when the prophet Samuel actually uh, comes upon Saul, who God told him would be king, when the prophet Samuel told Saul that you are being anointed king, Saul's response to him, this is back in chapter 9, he says, but am I not a Benjamite? From the smallest tribe of Israel, and is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say such a thing to me? Saul thought himself low from the beginning. So when David showed up on the scene, all David did was expose what was already there. Many people say right now, they say, well, social media is to blame for insecurity. Y'all, listen, social media exposes insecurity, but it's not the source. Because if you think about it, there are people in your family, on your job, in your class, in your neighborhood that triggered your insecurity before you were on these social networks. So the question is, how do we get free for real? And what we have to realize is it's a question of our identity. When you despise your roots, when you look at yourself and you say, well, I'm not, I'm not that good because look at my nose and I'm not that good. I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed of my family and, and I grew up in poverty and I was a victim of abuse and I don't want to talk about those things. The things you have to know is that our God is the God that wastes nothing. So everything that happened to you, everything in your background, God can use for his glory. There is nothing that you have experienced there is nothing that you have done that God cannot use. And we spend so much time covering it out of shame. But shame is a tool of the enemy to get you to dumb down your purpose, your trauma, your shame, your guilt. All of those things are not your burden. They are your ministry. They are your ministry. But we despise our roots. I know people right now that I know their history, but they would never share it with you because they feel ashamed of it. And I realize, I'm speaking to young people for a moment. <sighs> young people can be so mean, so mean. Look for any form of weakness to try to make a joke. But here's what I want you to do. You know how you, know how you can uh, neutralize the effect of people talking down on you? Acknowledge the truth. I tell my boys this all the time. They get so upset if they're out there playing basketball with their friends and they, they miss a shot and their friend says, oh, you're trash, you're trash. They get so upset. They go back and forth and back and forth with them. And I say, just own it. Yeah, man, I missed the shot. I got to try next time. But what we do instead is we defend and we deflect. And what that does is that gives power to insecurity. I had a situation happen, y'all laugh about it because it, it is funny. Um, uh, an interview just got released a couple of days ago. I did an interview a couple of months ago about my book, and it got released on social media. And I remember the day that I went in to record the interview. I was in a rush. And so I had to get in and sit down and do the interview. I didn't get a chance to really fix my hair. <laughs> and so when I saw some of the clips from the interview, y'all, my hair was looking a mess. And people were loving the content of the interview, but there was this one woman, she made a comment. She said, what is going on with her hair? She didn't know that I could see the comments. She said, what is going on with her hair? Now, if I was less mature, I would probably be like, who do you think you are? How are you talking about my hair? Look at your hair and da 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 But you know what I did instead? I said, girl, it was a bad hair day. It really was. I said, usually my hair is together, but that day it just wasn't together. And we laughed about it. And there's nothing else to say. Why? Because I owned it. But we spend so much time despising and, 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 and looking over and trying to, uh, trying to overlook our past and our roots. No, own it. Yeah, it is what it is. Because once you own it, the devil has no power over you. The third insight that I want to give you, and this is a thing that, y'all, it blessed me so much. Oh, my gosh. It blessed me so much. Because celebrating others is the key to kill comparison in yourself. It's the key. If you want to get free from toxic comparison, you're going to have to learn to celebrate the people who trigger your insecurity. 
The thing I love about Jonathan, there's so many things I love about Jonathan. But if you look at the scene in the Bible I told you about earlier where David and Saul come back to town and people are singing, David, you know, killed his 10,000s. And, and Saul began to get jealous of David at that moment. In that same scene, the Bible says that Jonathan took off his royal garment, gave it to David, and gave David his weapons. Why would he do that? Because in giving him his garment and in giving him his weapon, Jonathan was acknowledging the fact that God's favor was on his life. Jonathan said, you know what? I have no reason to be threatened by your victory because your victory is our victory. So let me help you be even more victorious. But what do we do? When we see somebody else succeed and we see somebody else win and insecurity gets triggered within us, what do we do? Oh, they think they're the bomb. Yeah, I'm not going over there to their store. I don't care that their store just broke a million dollars in sales. I'm not going over there. I'm not going to congratulate her on getting engaged because I want to get married. I'm not doing any of that. That's not fair. Instead, you kill comparison by leaning into the success. I'm so proud of you, sis. I'm so excited for you, brother. How can I support you? How can I help you further live out the purpose that God has on your life? How can I sow into what God is doing in your life? Because when you take that posture, the enemy no longer has power over insecurity. You have to learn to celebrate others. Because once you celebrate them, you get free from insecurity. You see, toxic comparison is only toxic when we allow it to distract us from what God is doing within us. God gave me a revelation that blessed me so much. I was a microbiology and cell science major in college at the University of Florida, and so I love studying uh, the, the physiological processes of the human body. And uh, when we take in air, when we breathe in air, it's a process known as inspiration. You know what inspiration does? It gives you life. It gives you vitality. It gives you energy. Healthy comparison inspires. When you see somebody else winning and you celebrate their success, you become inspired by their success. Do you know how I lost my weight? I found people on YouTube who had a ton of weight to lose and I followed their story. And it inspired me so that when I was starting to feel fatigued and like I wanted to give up, I would put one of their videos on and it would inspire me to keep going. Healthy comparison inspires, but the opposite process, the opposite physiological process, when you exhale air out, it's called expiration. That's why when you breathe your last breath, it's called your expiration date. Expiration draws life out of you. It leaves you fatigued. It leaves you tired. It leaves you feeling overwhelmed and depressed and exhausted. When you allow toxic comparison to live in your life, you will never actualize the purpose that God has for you because it expires purpose. But when you celebrate other people, my brother and my sister, you will Reclaim the power to walk in your purpose and live confident in who God created you to be. Listen, I know classes are about to start. And so my message right now, I want to give a special message to any students here. Whatever grades you are in, when you go into this school year, I don't care if people talk about your ears, your hair, talk about your jump shot. I don't care if people talk about your clothes. What I want you to do is learn to bless the people who speak ill of you. You know why? Because hurt people hurt people. See, when you are whole and healthy, you will never make fun of anybody. When you are whole and healthy, you will never try to degrade another person. So if you come across somebody who is constantly trying to tear you down, pray for them because they are hurting. Be the person who celebrates them. Be the person who uplifts and inspires. And I promise you will kill comparison because comparison can only live where it is allowed to take up residence. But we're serving some eviction notices today. <laughs>